it, everybody. It's Allie. And welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, January 22, 2023. Oh, that was so Cool! The way we got to see Jack sneaking in and out of Nikki and Victor's apartment. Ah! Uh, stealing those priceless jewels. Could you believe it? When he got to the front door, just cracked it open, then turned around and saw the neighbor's growling dog. He had to throw a piece of meat at the neighbor's growling dog just to get it to go away. Then when he got inside, he was like fumbling around for a lamp or something. He finally like gets to the safe. He holds his breath, hoping that the code was still the same. And then <gasps> click, he got it breathed a sigh of relief as he got the diamonds into his hand and then the maid comes in to clean the place and he had to real quick leap out the window and scale down the fire escape. God, what a great scene. <laughs> I couldn't have wrote it better myself. <laughs> All for Diane. All for the love and safety of Diane. Jack then presented Diane uh, with the jewels, and she turned around and presented Jeremy with them. He was very, very impressed, by the way. This piece of costume jewelry belonged to a long line of royals before Victor bought it on auction for Nikki and had that little tag put on it with the N and the V. Ooh, Jeremy wanted to put that NV necklace right onto Diane's neck and then have sex with her. <laughs> Priceless jewel sex. <laughs> oh, I had a laugh riot when she turned around, gave him this very passionate kiss acted like she was going to go through with some sex, and then started coughing. She goes, <laughs> I think I'm allergic to your cologne. <laughs> oh, I have got to remember that. I'm sorry I can't tonight. I think I'm allergic to your cologne or something. <laughs> she put it right on him. Oh, and then... Jeremy goes, but it's all natural. <laughs> How were we ever supposed to take him seriously as a villain, knowing that he goes out of his way to buy all natural cologne? <laughs> it's all natural. He looked sort of hurt, you know. It's all natural. I'm not my all natural cologne making you have a little eh, eh, Diane. Oh, no. And then... He was willing to take an entire shower to get all the all-natural cologne off of his body just so that she was a little more comfortable. I'm sorry, but he's a damn gentleman if you ask me. <laughs> Jeremy Stark is a pussy cat. And I wanted him to stay around. Oh, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed him. But I can't complain about the action. Oh, Diane and Jack decided to speed up their plan to get rid of Jeremy. So Diane planted the schematics to Nikki and Victor's apartment building underneath Jeremy's mattress where all boys keep their naughty papers right under the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> and then she put a black windbreaker into his dresser drawer. Um, that's the same one that I'm guessing Jack was wearing when he scaled down the fire escape. So, when Detective Chance Chancellor of the GCPD showed up to help out the boys from the Chicago PD, I mean, the Chicago cops are probably so busy with murders... They, they needed a little bit of help. They asked Chance to come in and casually <laughs> do the search with absolutely no backup 
and Stark standing right by the door most of the time. I'm sorry, I gotta back up a second because when Chance pulled up the mattress and saw the papers under there, he goes, step away from the door. I said, step away from the door. Like he had found a bomb under there or something and not just a stack of folded paper. <laughs> That moment was so heightened for a stack of folded paper. What if it was just Jeremy's first trimester checklist? Did you think of that, Chance? Have you been watching this show even? <laughs> oh. Then, Jack and Diane had the nerve to show up at the door to watch the show and also so that Diane could do that thing that she does so well. Lie! Lying to the cops, no less. Jeremy was there the whole time insisting that he had an alibi, he had been set up, but Diane, in her very convincing way, says, oh no, uh, he, this man has been harassing me, which I think is actually a pretty good idea, because if she were to press charges against him, like, they could add harassment to the list of charges against him, and maybe get him to stay away a little longer, but... Stark was not having it. He was really upset. I mean, he just got, got totally had. He got had so hard, and he was so mad about it that he actually lunged for Diane and Jack, and Chance had to jump between them and hold Stark back, and then whoop, big diamond necklace in his breast pocket. How'd that get there? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> oh, such a good dramatic scene. Jeremy Stark hauled away saying, Sleep lightly, Diane. I'll be back. <sighs> is that a threat? <laughs> or is that a promise that I would like to be fulfilled? <laughs> <laughs> Diane and Jack went home and they kissed it out declaring that it's all over all is safe in the world now absolutely nothing to worry about Jeremy Stark is gone forever clearly and then they decided to even move the party upstairs to Jack's bedroom oh Jack's bedroom how long has it been since we've seen that it is just as brown as I remember it <laughs> brown 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 and more brown <laughs> perfection you nailed it Y&R that's all you had to do brown maybe a little cream accent that's Jack's bedroom yes <laughs> what a treat Whole week was worth it just to get to that bedroom scene. Oh, and they shot it so it was like you were looking from the outside in. Like you were out, like the viewers. You're outside Jack's window looking in at him having sex for the first time in decades. <laughs> what a treat. <laughs> they totally just <clears throat> threw all caution to the wind. I mean, they didn't even blink an eye at the fact that Chance stopped by to follow up on behalf of the Chicago police to ask some questions about all of the holes in this story, such as, well, since there was no breaking and entering, how the heck did Jeremy Stark know the codes to Nikki and Victor's apartment? And why would he steal just one piece of jewelry when he could have had the mother load in the entire contents of the safe? <laughs> Diane and Jack were like, nope, I don't know. Jeremy is the bad guy. We're innocent. We win. So therefore, it's over. Okay. Well, um, if it's over, then good on them. Round of applause. I 
officially declare this to have been a great little story by Y&R. Well done, Y&R. Big, big props. I've really enjoyed everything about Jeremy Stark and the jewel business from A to Z. It's been a total success for me. And so I'm ready to declare that if it's all over. But if it's not all over and there's still more fun to be had, well, then I'd be really happy with that, too. I'm really holding out for a Phyllis, Jeremy, Tucker love triangle. I'm just so in on this. I really hope that Jeremy gets to come back. I think there's a good chance of it. I mean, it took Nikki all of, what, three seconds to make the connection about all of this. She said, we haven't changed the codes to the apartment in years. How could Stark have gotten them. And then she looked over at Jack and Diane and the light bulb completely went on in her head. I'm sure that she is going to be reporting this, if not to the police, then to Phyllis. Phyllis is still leading the anti-Diane charge, so maybe the world is not safe. I could definitely see Jeremy getting a good lawyer, showing back up on bail, and partnering up with Phyllis. I mean, she spent the whole week, she spent the whole year, looking for an ally to take Diane down with. And Jeremy really would have a great motive now. There's no one that hates Diane more than Jeremy Stark right now. And Phyllis was saying stuff like she wants to speed up her plan her plan to get rid of Diane. Diane and Jack wanted to speed up their plan to get rid of Jeremy, and Phyllis is wanting to speed up her plan to get rid of Diane. Phyllis can't stop talking about it. It's completely an obsession at this point. It's all she thinks about. It's all she talks about. Like, she's lost one job over it, and she's very well poised to lose the job with Daniel over it too. I mean, Daniel's just trying to get some work done. Could you hire some people? Could you do a little work and like hire some people so we can get to work? It was pretty satisfying too, early in the week, to realize how close Phyllis actually was to getting exactly what it is that she wants. Diane out of the way. And she didn't even know it because while Jack was in Chicago and before the sting went down, Phyllis walked right up to Jeremy, asked what he and Diane were up to, but did not like, and cause she had to, has that photo of them, but she did not mention the fact to Jeremy that she also saw Diane kissing Jack. So Phyllis saw Diane and Jeremy out together, has a picture of it. And she also saw Diane and Jack kissing. If she had told Jeremy that piece of information like that oh you look like you're so cozy with Diane but guess what she was kissing Jack if she had mentioned that to him the whole sting would have been over right then and there Diane and Jack would have been busted so that was a good moment of suspense for the story too another way that this was really really good and even now, I mean, Phyllis could pass along that photo of Diane and Jeremy. Um, I mean, they look like they're out on a date together. She could give that to the cops. She could give that to Stark's lawyer. It could be some evidence that would help his case. Um, in fact, wasn't Diane with Jeremy the night of the uh, robbery? Maybe. I don't know. Let's see how that picture comes back into play. But the other thing, too, is then... If, if Phyllis were to disclose all of that in order to take Diane down, it would mean that she was taking Jack down, too. So, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Jeremy is gone for good. Maybe Phyllis will just uh, keep working on Tucker, pulling him in for a complain fest. That's what she likes to do. Complain fest. And Tucker is her new target. With a lot of animosity there, too. With a lot of, like seething under the surface animosity, Phyllis and Tucker. I predict some future hate sex there, I think. Devon met with Lily and Jill this week to plead his case for getting Hamilton Winters back from the merged company that is Chancellor Winters. Uh, to which Jill and Lily basically said, no? We're not going to give you the company back, but if you wait until after 
we take the company public, we'll just give you a boatload of money to start your own business, something new. Which is not what Devon wants. He doesn't want something new. He wants, is clinging to, feels emotionally attached to the old business, the one that he started with Neil. But on top of that, I think Devon wants autonomy now. <laughs> One thing we have learned about Devon Hamilton from the past year is that he needs to be the boss. He needs to be the one in control. He needs to be the one making decisions. He's the visionary. And he doesn't work well with the visions of others. And so that's why I think he is not going to take the deal that Lily has offered. Even though Abby tried to smooch him into it. <laughs> she tried to smooth it out to peace, keep the peace with Lily. But I think Devon is going to fight them. And I think it is going to become ugly. And I think it is going to tap Chancellor Winter's finances. Um, and the first thing that's going to be on the chopping block, of course, will be Daniel's Omega Sphere. Judging from the previews and from the way that Phyllis was telling Tucker to stay away from Daniel, I'm guessing that Tucker will turn around and finance Omega Sphere, probably thinking that it's an altruistic mission statement, the whole like, do games to better your life, and that if he funds something altruistic, then that will help redeem him in Devon's eyes. We saw him this week pulling out the wad of cash to pay for Devon's drink. I think we're going to see him do a larger scale version of that, wherein he's putting down the finances to fund something that he thinks is going to make him look better to Devon. This week he gave Devon the whole speech about why he did what he did. That he had a family business dream. And Devon gave him his five minutes and then said, okay, yeah, well that's all very nice. But instead of making the whole family business dream happen like a normal human being, you decided to use lies and deceit. And so now I don't trust you and I think you should just get out of town. Just get out of town, leave. That's like the second time he said that. Get out of town, leave. I don't want to have anything more to do with you. And then Tucker hangs his head and walks out the door. Very sad. And I'm not sure if I feel sorry for Tucker or if I'm actually enjoying watching him suffer. <laughs> I can't decide. Maybe it's both. Maybe I feel sorry that I'm enjoying watching him suffer. Sharon really needs a sign on the front of her lemonade stand that says, psychiatric help, five cents. <laughs> or at least she needs a sign on the Crimson Lights front door, one that she can flip where it says the doctor is in or the doctor is out. <laughs> it goes with the open and close sign. They flip them, flip them together. Or maybe, I don't know, Sharon, maybe she is more of a high school career counselor this week because she helped Chance work through some new feelings. <laughs> some new feelings that have come to light for him. Maybe he's not suited for a career in law enforcement anymore. Maybe he's tired of working in a town where you're expected to look the other way for the crimes of certain people. I mean, the Jeremy Stark bust had so many holes in it, you could strain your pasta. And it's exactly the same thing that it was with Ashland Locke. 
So, Chance is sick of it. Plus, it's a high-risk job. There's a lot on the line, and it hasn't exactly helped him to cultivate a very fulfilling personal life. So, maybe now it is time for a change. But what would that be? Just spending all his time with Sharon, I guess. <laughs> Chance's new job title is Sharon's boyfriend. <laughs> the God's honest truth right there. That's his new job title, Sharon's boyfriend. Or maybe we could also possibly, if things go well, we could call him Grandpa Chance <laughs> so that he can be Grandpa Chance with Grandma Sharon once Mariah and Tessa's baby gets here. Well, hey, we got some good news on that front. Um, the meeting with Delphine who's the birth mother, uh, went very well, and the girls reported that Delphine has agreed to choose them to adopt her baby, and that the baby is going to be here by the end of February. That's so soon. <sighs> yeah, it's, that's good news. I'm, I, I, I'm glad that Abby was there to hear it too. I mean, everybody was happy, but I specifically noted that Abby got to be there to kind of, well, return the support that was given to her during the whole uh, Dom's birth fiasco, that whole thing. So I hope that Abby continues to be there for Mariah and Tessa. I hope that the next month. I mean, it's a month away. The end of February is a month away. So I hope we spend the next month in a flurry of happy baby preparation joy. I want to see a baby shower with some cupcakes. I, I don't know if they'll be pink or blue cupcakes, but either maybe yellow. I don't know. We don't have to be gender specific on the cupcakes. Let's just get the cupcakes. I want to see that. I want to see some decorating of the nursery. And I want to see Delphine. Where's she at? Maybe there's some light drama to be had there. Uh, if she, you know, she's not entirely sure. Or, ooh, what if some feelings developed there? I don't know. They said, I don't know anything about her except they said she's young. But then they also said she was working on her bachelor's degree. So she's not that young. They also said that the baby's father agreed to uh, relinquish his parental rights, but who knows? That could change. Um, it's going to be probably a bumpy month. I mean, Mariah and Tessa seem to acknowledge that, seem to realize that. They know that they've made progress, but um, they realize that it's not a guarantee. I actually think this could be a good story to stretch out longer than just a month. I feel like I could probably hang out in this story until spring. If, if YNR actually brings the drama to the screen instead of making it happen off screen in whatever town, in whatever place this birth mother who we haven't met lives in. Pizza night at Chelsea's place. Abby's got a new flatbread pizza. I'm sure it's the bomb. <laughs> they even got a society branded pizza box for it that says hot stuff on the side. <laughs> I was really enthralled by the pizza box. Also the fact that there was no way that pizza was still hot stuff for as long as Billy sat there chatting with Lily. They were kind of reinforcing how much they still care about each other and how much they still want to be there to support each other, even after things were so awkward between them at the beginning of the week, with Billy and Chelsea running into Lily and Daniel at the coffee house. It's got to continue to be awkward even if there's good blood between everybody. I mean, you live in a town with only three places to go. <laughs> it's going to keep coming up. But Billy got the pizza home safely. <laughs> Most exciting part about the story. 
And I say home because that's where Billy's been spending most of his time lately at Chelsea's house. I'm assuming he's going to be moving out of the shared apartment with Lily. I kind of wish we could see that. I mean, that would be an interesting week. Put up that set and make them pack everything up and, you know, get, get into the real grit of what a breakup looks like. I mean, breaking up the stuff is one of the really hard parts about the breakup. I mean, Lily and Billy don't have to go through the, you know, the divorce that shows up over Christmas. The papers get served to you over Christmas like Abby and Chance and then boom, boom, the marriage over. They, the, but they're breaking up a life together. I'd, I'd like to see it. But I, I think the story seems to be quickly shifting away from Billy Lily Chelsea into Billy Victoria Chelsea. It's like Victoria's getting swapped out into that triangle. And, and once again, I'm very impressed with Victoria this week. I think she's handling all of this like a champ. She has had... 10 years, 12 years, however however old Johnny is, I don't remember. But she's had all that time to call the shots and to make all of the decisions in his life, to have all of the control. And now she's having to hand over some of that control over to, well, Johnny himself, but also to Billy, who is a proponent of the Chelsea relationship, and even over to Chelsea herself. So... I think it's completely understandable that uh, Victoria feels like she's losing a part of her family while everyone else is feeling like they're gaining family. It's an interesting juxtaposition there, but it's tough. And uh, I just don't know where this is leading for Victoria's story. I mean, it's interesting to pause here. But then what? Where does Victoria's story go after that? Is she going to be fighting to reunite her family with Billy and maybe squeeze Chelsea out of the picture? Or is there going to be something or someone new on the horizon for Victoria? Adam got up in Billy's face this week. Like he was Billy getting up in Adam's face or something. Like usually issuing warnings to stay away from someone is more of a Billy thing to do than Adam. It's not really an Adam thing to do. So it's it was weird, but it was kind of nice seeing the tables turned. I don't know what's up with it though. Is Adam planning on rekindling his feelings for Chelsea or does he just not want Billy hanging around her pied a terre so to speak <laughs> doesn't Adam have better things to do doesn't he know he's got a baby on the way oh wait he doesn't know that because no one's gonna tell him Sally confessed to Nick this week that she is pregnant, but really she only confessed because Nick guessed. If there is one thing that Nick Newman knows, <laughs> it's sex and what happens when you have someone have sex with someone a lot? Babies. He knows that sex, he knows sex and then he knows sex equals babies. He's a complex guy. <laughs> but he's so he's so cute i'm i love my nick is dumb jokes <laughs> but he is so cute and he's so sincere and he looked at sally with his cute blue eyes and his little curl that was coming down over his forehead and it needed to be swept back a little bit but he his hair looks good he looks good right now and he said to sally well why didn't you just tell me this and she said I was just not willing to face it. I, I, I wanted things to continue to be light and fun and sexy between us. And now everything is going to change and I am not ready for it. Can we just pretend for a little while longer that this isn't happening? Oh, that, 
really resonated with me uh, when she said that. Like, can't I just keep going on with life as it is? Can I just keep my comfort, my routine, my predictability for a little while longer instead of being forced to change? That's so normal when change is being forced upon you. And, and Sally grasps the gravity of it. She she knows. She she realizes her life. She's got a lot coming up. I mean, it, and it's it's hard. It, but, it, but it's all on the table now. Um, it's all on the table between Sally and Nick. But the one piece of it that Nick and Sally both know, yet they are n neither of them admitting out loud, is that Adam might damn well be the father too. They both know it. I don't know if it hasn't completely dawned on Nick yet, but he saw that they slept together. He walked in and saw their sex bed. So he knows. They both know. <sighs> and they're just not going to tell him. Because the thing is, it's not just about Nick and Sally thinking that their relationship is going to change and now they've got to get all serious because they're going to have a child to raise together. Like, they both know that there is a messy can of worms that's going to spill out and they can't avoid it and it's going to happen the second that Adam realizes that Sally's pregnant and then does the math. But they're not going to tell him. I am telling you right now, I am telling you they are not going to tell him. They are both going to stick their heads in the sand and pretend that little fact away. It makes me feel really bad for Adam because Nick and Sally are just dismissing him and his own father is actively working against him. Oh, I never tire of hearing Victor talk about how he grew up in a damned orphanage. It's like one of my favorite tracks on the Victor Newman Best of CD. <laughs> I grew up in an orphanage. I built this company from the ground up. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> Just pick your track. <laughs> I also never tire of hearing Adam and Victor having the same argument that they've been having for a decade. <laughs> Victor thinks that everything wrong in their relationship goes back to Hope's decision to raise Adam, raise Victor Jr. on the farm in Kansas, but he doesn't realize why Hope made that decision and how it connects to the man that he was, is, and always will be. Father and son just do not get along. This is the thing. They just don't see eye to eye. They never will. They really should stay away from each other. The very best that Adam and Victor could hope for at this point would be awkward holidays. <laughs> That should be the top of the mountain. But Victor is just not going to be happy until he has crushed Adam's soul into dust and then shackled him to Newman Enterprises with the other two. <laughs> Victor wants them all in shackles working for Newman Enterprises and doing everything he says. At all times. But he loves his family. He's all about family. <laughs> Did Adam say, somebody said something this past week about, was it, who was it? I don't, can't remember. It might have, must have been Adam. That Victor just uses the I do everything for my family line as a way to justify anything he wants. It's pretty great. And now Kyle's going to be the perfect dope to help him get away with doing it again. I think this story had so much potential if Adam had been actively poking at Victor 
to provoke him. And if we had spent the past couple of months building up the Kyle and Adam rivalry at Jabal. But why would I even care about getting Adam out of Jabal when he's never there? Even when Jack gave him his performance review a few weeks ago, it was at Crimson Lights. This is the first week that we've even seen Adam at Jabal in months. The other problem with this story is that Adam already sees it coming. Victor and Kyle are meeting at Jabot in front of a big picture window where everyone can see them. They are openly plotting where Adam can see them plotting. Uh, that's just not very exciting. <clears throat> I think that Kyle is going to barter with Victor to make sure that any suspicions he and Nikki have about Diane's involvement or connection to the jewelry robbery, robbery stay silent. And then in exchange, Kyle will just go along with whatever Victor wants up to and including all of the hypocrisy that he's going to commit by doing to Adam exactly what he scolded Phyllis for doing to Diane. That's what I think. Adam told Summer on Friday that Victor's manipulating Kyle. Well, that's not very hard to do, is it? Tell that to the woman who has to hand Kyle his breakfast banana. Probably has to peel it for him, too. <laughs> Did you see the moment of defiance where Kyle grabbed his banana? Fine, I'll grab my own banana. And then he walked out the door. They weren't going to work together. And he said, fine, I'll grab my own banana. And I'll peel it myself. I'll show you. <laughs> Mother wife. But I really want my mother. I just want my mother. But I want my mother and my wife. And then I want my mother wife. I want my mother and I want my mother wife. <laughs> oh, I am so glad that Summer and Kyle are disagreeing all over the place right now. How about you? That's our poll question for this week. Summer and Kyle. Do you want them to be kept together or are you wanting them to banana split up? You tell me. Go to yrchat.com. Cast your vote for or against Kyle and Summer. I mean, I liked Kyle and Summer a lot. I like Kyle and Summer a lot. But we did say a couple of weeks ago that Kyle and Summer might be hotter tickets on the singles market right now. It might be kind of fun to be to swap them around a little bit. And until then, I do really enjoy seeing them argue. Although at the same time, they're basically having the exact same fight that Ashley and Jack have been having and that Phyllis and Jack have been having and that Phyllis has been having with anyone who will sit down long enough to listen to her. Control is an illusion. I love that line. The answer was Daniel. It was Daniel who said that line. Control is an illusion. It's totally true. And he said it to Lily during that park scene. She had just, you know, broke, she broke up with Billy. She was having all these troubles with Devon and they were outside at the park and he was, she was talking to him about how her whole life situation feels out of control and he told her control is an illusion. Oh, how smart. He's sexy and smart. <laughs> Oh, congratulations, Henry, T. Nicole, Daisy, and Sue W. You guys are the only ones who guessed that right. What? I thought there would be more people hanging on Daniel's every word. How about this one? Here's the quote. And the hits keep coming. I don't know. I just kind of like that. Mostly because it's also an album title of uh, it's one of Michael Nesmith's album titles from the monkeys you know Mike Woolhat from the monkeys he had a whole independent music career and one of the uh, really good albums called uh, and the hits just keep on coming so who said
did that and the hits keep coming. That, that, that's the quote that stuck out to me this week. Did it stick out to you? If so, you can go to yrchat.com and tell me who said it by leaving your guess uh, in the little box. And one guess per person. And if you get it right, I will give you a shout out during next week's YNR chat. All right, let's read some comments. Henry says, I feel that Summer and Kyle will eventually split. Hopefully, Tara will return. But then I thought about who would be the next available guy for Summer. Then it happened. Finn is back. Oh, yeah, Henry. So you were like, hmm, who would be a good guy for Summer? And then, boom, Summer's longtime childhood best friend who has always had a crush on her Finn. <laughs> He shows up in those previews. Uh, yes, I heard it was going to be a very special episode for Michael and Lauren seeing their son back in town. I have to be honest with you, Finn does not move me. I'm not huge into him. I I don't know. I just did, He didn't really do much when he was on the show, and now he's been off for a while. I mean, that actor, not even necessarily who I think of when I think of Finn. So, uh, no offense. It's just, you know, we haven't seen him as much, and uh, so it's hard to get real excited about about seeing him but it gives me my Michael and Lauren and that's what I am excited about so I guess we're gonna have a, a fan set centric episode next week and maybe it'll be so amazing knock my socks off and I'll become a fan fan uh, and next week's time at this time well let's talk about basically everyone's favorite topic this week ja Jack and Diane Daisy has kind of a fun theory here fun theory comment saying Diane's true plan is coming to fruition. Diane planned for Jack to steal the necklace and plant Stark's glasses. What Jack did not know was that Diane made sure his own fingerprints would be found, making him look guilty for planting false evidence and stealing. And once that's discovered and Jack lands in jail, Diane will set her sights on what she really wants, taking Jabot for herself. She believes she is owed Jabot after having been harmed by Jack and the others and then forced to disappear. Diane may think she's hoodwinked everyone, but not all the Abbots believe in Diane's transformation. They know her. Ashley washed her hands of Jack in his ignorance and went back to Paris, which Diane sees as a win. But Tracy is still there and notices Diane is up to something. So Tracy follows Diane and discovers the truth that Diane's trying to take Jabot from the Abbots. Tracy then calls Ashley to let her know what she's discovered, but the only thing Ashley hears is Tracy saying her name, then click. We should write this show. <laughs> there should be a spinoff. Fan spinoff. There probably are. It probably is something like that on the internet somewhere, but that's so good. Well, I like that you've got your Diane Doubt woven in there and that you've let Tracy come in to be the heroine to save the day. Tracy really has always been so hands-off with Jabot, really. I mean, she's kind of the... She's the black sheep of the family. She was, hasn't really participated as much. She she does some board. She's done some board votes here and there, I think, but she doesn't materially participate in the business. Wouldn't it be nice if she did? And then she foiled a plot by Dirty Diane. Dolora says, as I've said before, Diane is an extremely dangerous woman. She manipulated her way back to Genoa City, pleading and swearing that she was a changed woman. Yet time and time again, she has chosen to come clean about a lie that was exposed. Her past came to town with Tucker McCall, then Jeremy Stark. Yes, Phyllis helped this happen. But the most dangerous thing she's made happen was getting Jack to commit and or be guilty of a crime. Kyle accessory to that crime after the fact. And who has clean hands of this guilt? Diane. Oh, what a tangled web she spun. I guess it was truly worth it for Jack. For his reward of a good night of sex. Way to go, Abbott family. Way to go. However, I don't think this is going to be over for them regarding Jeremy Stark. Look out! Jeremy came to Genoa City to ask Diane for money. This latest thing they set him up will be a situation that's going to be more than expected. Yeah, yeah. He came in pretty hard just wanting some his money. And now, if he comes back, he's going to want revenge. 
Well, counterpoint, Ellen says Jack made his own decisions here with his eyes wide open. He wasn't manipulated into anything, and he's having more fun and feeling more needed and alive than he has in a very, very long time. Let Jack run free with his new love. Oh, and I do hope John Mellencamp sings a little ditty about Jack and Diane at their wedding. Oh, they've got to do that. When, when Jack and Diane get married at the end of the year, maybe sooner, they've got, YNR has got to spring to get John Mellencamp on the show. He probably doesn't, wouldn't want to do that. At least, can we at least get the song rights to play that at, you know, at their dance, at the, you know, at the reception or something? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, uh, oh, Ellen, your birthday. Happy birthday! Let's see, that's going to be on the 27th. So you've got a beautiful birthday coming up uh, just in a couple of days here. What I'd love to know from you is what would be your birthday wish for Adam? Because I, you are Adam's number one YNR Chatter fan. You are his official, unofficial attorney. So... I'm curious to know, what would you see as an ideal storyline direction for Adam? Because he's, he's, they don't know what to do with him. He, so he's sort of like waffling in and around this Chelsea thing. And then he's got this thing coming at him with Victor. And then he's going to find out that he's a candidate to be a dad for Nick and Sally. But none of it's a really clear direction. None of, honestly, none of it excites me. So I'm a little curious what would be um, your ideal birthday wish dream storyline for your favorite character, Adam. And happy birthday again. I hope it's a lovely one for you. Love, love, love. Gary says, I'm loving the love. If Jack believes in the brave Diane, then it must be true. Dina's love prophecy for her son is complete. This is the one he's been waiting for that I've been waiting for. Yeah, me too. <laughs> You're right. This is officially the fulfillment of Dina's prophecy. Unless you're Daisy or Dolores or the many other people who uh, see through Diane um, into the darkness of her soul and believe that she's still a bad girl villain out uh, plotting something. Or at least if she's not plotting something, maybe um, capitalizing on something. Maybe just sort of getting her way a little bit. But yeah. I, Diana says with some common sense here, it was very odd and unrealistic how Jack and Diane never once were worried or had a second thought about their plan not working out perfectly. As you said, Chance hinted at how he thought it was a setup and Nikki as well. Even Kyle and Summer pointed out that Jeremy could have a solid alibi of his whereabouts on the evening the crime took place. Jack and Diane are both acting as though Jeremy's been convicted. It's silly that they aren't worried at all about him finding out that he got set up and coming for them. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm starting to think this, it just dawned on me during my inner chat, but I'm wondering if Phyllis's photo is Jeremy's alibi. Ah, <gasps> if! Hold on a minute. Follow me here. Hold on. If Phyllis took the photo as the crime was being committed in Chicago, which I think that's true, then that means that it's an alibi for both Jeremy and Diane, which means it leaves a big, wide, gaping hole or of where Jack was at the time. That's the better question. What's Jack's alibi? And if that's the case, then maybe there's some merit here for Daisy and Dolores uh, to, that maybe Diane did set Jack up to take the fall. Or maybe Jack will just end up taking the fall and that wasn't her intention. I don't know, but I do also kind of like the idea of her coming for Jabot and, you know, like just becoming... I kind of like the idea of Jan Diane getting control of Jabot. Yeah, that's that's um, appealing and just like letting letting it out, getting done with the nice act and just rawr, going for it. That'd be a little fun to watch. Well, Gary says it is weird that Chance Chancellor is quitting the force for the latest CEO position somewhere. Better to quit than to stir up trouble going after Diane and Jack to defend Jeremy Stark. You walked out on Newman, you can walk out on Jeremy Stark. You walked out on Newman, you can walk out on the Jeremy Stark case. Let the innocent man fry. 
<laughs> he has been outsmarted. Let the innocent man fry. He's been outsmarted. Yeah, I like that. But also, Gary, so you make a great point. I mean, there's no other career options in town. So if Chance is not the cop, he's basically going to go work at Chancellor Winters because, well, that's his name. May Chancellor, maybe he will start to catch wind of everything that's going on, the turmoil at Chancellor Winters, and maybe he'll go, my family name, my Chancellor family crest, that is my sworn duty, so I will go work at Chancellor Winters to uphold the name of Chancellor and go push some papers or something somewhere. Boring. <laughs> Here's what's not boring. Naomi says, I'm beginning to like Sharon and Chance possibly getting together. She brought out her best karate slash dance moves and made Chance smile. Somehow Abby and Chance fell apart, maybe because Abby's so insecure around him. But Abby's at ease with Devon, so I guess let it be. Had to get in my own song reference there. Oh yeah, the Beatles, Let It Be. That whole album's fantastic. It really is. That's their final album, Let It Be. 1970, maybe? Um, but you like Sharon and Chance together. I'm starting to like Sharon and Chance together. It was the karate moves that got me. <laughs> no doubt. Basically... Whatever Sharon wants and whatever Sharon make whatever makes Sharon happy will make me happy. That's how I feel. If Sharon wants Chance and to be lighthearted and fun and flirty with Chance doing her karate move, uh, dance moves, then I'm all for it. They have received my approval. Oh, but Sherrod says, I want my hashtag Taryn. That's Tessa and Sharon. Oh, the two of them look so comfortable together standing there holding one another. If I have to endure hashtag Nally, that's Nick and Sally, then I need something in exchange. <laughs> I loved when Sharon said to Tessa that it had been a while since she was a barista at Crimson Lights and that she was going to alert Tessa's fans. Such teasing made my day. Sharon and Tessa in 2023. How about that? Uh, hey, speaking of Kate Fairbanks, um, Sherrod also says that uh, she guest starred on Chicago Fire last night. Loved seeing her spread her wings, and she was good. It's also interesting that she got this role on Chicago Fire not long um, after Michelle Morgan landed her role on Chicago Med. NBC also has a Chicago PD. Dick Wolf Productions are pretty good. Oh. So that's, yeah, I heard that Michelle Morgan uh, had been on an episode and Kate Fairbanks too. It's always interesting to see someone who, you know, you maybe not even expecting to see in a different show. And it's like, well, what? That's Tessa. I had, there was a, my mom was watching a Hallmark movie over the holidays and I looked over and there's Melissa Clara Egan. I'm like, oh, Chelsea's in this. Okay. So that was, it's always kind of interesting. And Victoria says, if you're a Murphy fan, that's Catherine's husband. He's in a recent episode of Will Trent on ABC. It's the third episode and he plays a pivotal role. It was good to see him again. Murph! You mean Murph was on Will Trent? I don't know any of these. I've never seen any of these shows, but I, I love Murph. I have great fond memories of Murph. Aww. Yeah, I mean, he's been around a long time. I'm not going to be able to pull his head off. I'm not going to be able to pull his name up off the top of my head, but that actor's been around a while. He's been uh, working a long time. I bet he's got a really long list uh, on his IMDb. Well, new topic. Ron says... My wish for 2023 is to see Devon change careers. The entitled air slash media mogul has ran its course and he isn't very good at being a leader. The question is, what would be a good fit? Hmm. What would be a good fit for Devon? I feel like I could see Devon running a nightclub or something. He's He has 
the ability to be very relaxed and he pulls it off well. So I could see him opening a club or being involved in a club or something. He, Devon, he works as a man of leisure for me. But, he, you know, I mean, this is working for me, too. Uh, it's just that it doesn't make his character look very appealing at all times. Here's a great comment from Ellen who says, Let Devon buy his way out for ten times the value. If he says he doesn't care about money, this is it. This is a great point. If Devon wants his company back so badly, then let him shell out the money to buy it instead of forcing the corporation into the red to correct for him changing his mind. He agreed to the merger. Um, I agree. Lily and Jill changed the game plan. Uh, but, you know, I mean, change is part of life. Uh, when you give up a little control, you sometimes give up all control. He went into it with his eyes open. Yes, he had his reservations, but ultimately he made the decision to merge. And now he's expecting them to just put the company into a dangerous financial state in order to buy him out. He always wants everything exactly his way with no leeway. That's the the problem with Devon. But you know what? I want to say a couple of, you know, a year ago or so, I was so annoyed that Devon was just nothing but the town minister. He was all of a sudden the, oh, the guy, man who knows everything. He's, he's the wise one, oh, wise one, Devon. And that wasn't very fulfilling either. So, so you know, in, in that way, I, I like that Devon has a flaw. It's a glaring <laughs> flaw. And I like Ron's idea that maybe he takes on a different kind of career in 2023. Daisy says, I hope Devon takes Jill and Lily to court. They betrayed his trust by allowing two separate people to attempt to take over chancellors. And even though they put both companies at risk, they refused to allow Devon to buy his company back. Their proposal was ridiculous. Devon and Neil created the company from the ground up, but Devon took it beyond that. So Jill and Lily had no involvement in what it became. I think Devon could say in court that their bad choices risked losing the entire company, including the company he created from the ground floor. Also, a great twist would be, before anyone goes to court, if Devon asks Tucker to help him get his company back in the most honest way possible, possible but not probable with Tucker, and then Jill and Lily are none the wiser. Um, can you believe, you guys, that Jill and Lily are still barreling forward with this IPO, even though they've uncovered two separate attempts to take over the company and they're just still like, okay, well, I don't care. We're just still going to do this. <laughs> Who even cares that the barbarians are at the gate? We're jam the torpedoes. We're going forward with the IPO. Why are they doing that? I mean, I guess to your point, if I was Devon, I wouldn't want to work with them either. <laughs> it's kind of dumb and risky. Oh, Diana says, I love it when Tucker just took the garnishes from his drink and tossed them onto the table before having a sip of his cocktail. I think he improvises often in his scenes. I'm sure that no one told him to do that, and I've never seen any of the other actors do that. I also noticed that he finished the entire drink, another thing we don't usually see the actors doing. They mostly just play with their food and drinks by twirling around the straw or the cutlery, but this actor comes across as so natural, suave, and unpredictable. I always enjoy when he's on screen. Diana, when he took the celery and just whapped it right onto the napkin, I mean, everybody had to have their eyes on that. It is so subtle, uh, yet it just drew the attention. I mean, he's really a good actor. He really makes it feel natural. He just took because it's the same thing I did. I would do. I'm not going to eat the celery in a Bloody Mary. I might give it a stir and then toss it off to the side. But then the other thing was, you could tell that Michelle Stafford was not going to be outdone on the Bloody Mary game because. Because then, as soon as he whapped that garnish right out of the way, she had to then start drinking her Bloody Mary through the straw by, like, 
putting her finger over the top of the straw, drawing up the liquid, then pulling the bottom of the straw out of the cup, and then sucking the Bloody Mary from the bottom of the straw. So Michelle Stanford was like, oh, sh uh, she saw his garnish game. And then she was like, oh, I am not going to be that staged. <laughs> You want Bloody Mary game? Well, watch this. And then she did her little straw act. <laughs> Michelle Stafford is not going to let somebody else have all the attention. <laughs> Great moment. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, how about that poll from last week? I asked you guys, Audra, take her or leave her? Hey, you know I love a split vote. 51% of you want to take her. 49% of you want to leave her. Kamna says, I like Audra. She's stunning, smart, and ambitious. She reminds me of Jill. Plus, I actually think she may be the only woman who could keep Tucker in line. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's fiery. Henry says, my vote is to take her. <laughs> she's gorgeous. And she had so much to be desired by the eligible guys in Genoa City. Nate won't be able to eventually be romantically involved with Audra. That could be explosive, but I would hate to see Elena get hurt, but that would open up a few new avenues for her path back to Devon. So there's so many possibilities if Audra remains an integral part of the cast. Okay, so what you're saying, Henry, is that the guys feel about Audra the way the girls feel about Daniel. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Here's Sue W. Kind of summing up how I feel about Audra, too. She says, I'll take her, although I'm not completely sold yet. While Audra is supposedly smart and skilled, she still seems rather vapid to me. She's Always well-spoken and confident and certainly uses powerful business jargon, but her often guarded delivery falls flat at times. I think she has some fiery potential, although, so I'm, I'm looking for a feistier Audra in both her work and professional life. A Nate Victoria Audra triangle could be good. Sue W. Her often guarded delivery. Yeah! I don't know how you possibly put that into words, but it rings really true. There is something where it's almost like she's almost going there, but not fully going there. Maybe she's just not being given the opportunity. Uh, but but it, you also say it's like she's, she's there. She's saying the lines. She's beautiful. Uh, she's clearly intelligent. And yet there's something that is missing. Heather K says, I'll take her, but change her to use her better. I want to see another vulnerable side of Audra. Make us like her more. Give us something to make us root for her. Y&R has made her somewhat unlivable and then unbelievable, maybe, and then desperate. It does not make sense. They need to use her strengths. She has good chemistry with people like Noah, Nate, maybe even Kyle could go for a one night stand when he's mad at summer. <laughs> yeah, this is it, Heather Kay. She needs to be made vulnerable. And then I think that'll give her character a little bit of stuffing. Well, speaking about vulnerability and uh, ending on another comment by Heather Kay. Chelsea has had about 15 minutes of therapy and she is now the most self-actualized person on the show. Come on. That conversation with Victoria was too much. Don't worry, Victoria. I used to be selfish, but now I come in peace and harmony. Maybe she and Sharon can open up a therapy clinic now and fight over the same men that come in for advice. It's great that Y&R tackles difficult subject matters, but then don't make everyone get cured in minutes and then become the town healer. Heather K. Amen. Amen. You are preaching to the choir on this topic. Chelsea went from good and gritty to like goopy goo in the matter of two weeks time like uh, it just it's unbelievable it's just it's too much 
I think we got to turn this around somehow. Chelsea needs to get turned around somehow. We got to make her more exciting and less angelic. Do Nikki and Victor have any Pieta chairs in any other cities with some stuff in it that maybe Chelsea could steal? Oh! Okay, everybody. That takes me to the end of another Y&R chat. But now... It's time for you to leave your comments. You should go to yrchat.com. Tell me what you're thinking about the week of shows. Tell me what you think about this very YNR chat. I always love reading your comments. And, oh, Diana wrote me a poem this week, too. I'm so lucky to have such wonderful friends to talk about YNR with. And thank you again. That really does help boost me. And if you want to read Diana's beautiful poem, uh, it's in the daily chat thread for uh, this past week. Um, and you can read all of the comments that people are leaving there. It's, it's always interesting to see what you guys are responding to versus what you don't like about the show. And we're so, I'm still seeing some predictions getting squeezed in there. Just some, you know, light, short-term predictions. I mean, we, we are kind of always predicting right we're always predicting where the story is gonna go um and yeah i feel good about it right now i had a good week with the jack and diane fun and it sounds like maybe phyllis is about to crank some stuff up so i think we got another good week of y and coming so uh, come back next sunday and we will talk about what's new in genoa city and until then i hope you guys have a really good week i love ya bye